1992, the now defunct Midway Games released the first in what would become one of the most famous franchises in video game history. Mortal Kombat today may be known for blood, guts, bones, violence, and brutality, but 26 years ago, things were just getting started. Over the next several months, we are going to cover the entire history of Mortal Kombat, from the arcades to the home consoles and damn near everything in between. There is plenty of blood to spill, stories to be told, and secrets to uncover, so we will waste no time and jump right into 1992 with the first game in the series. If you've been living under a rock for almost 30 years, I know what you might be thinking. What is Mortal Kombat? What the hell does it all mean? Why are these people fighting? Well, here's the deal. Earthrealm's warriors are defending the entire planet from the bad guys of Outworld, who are trying to win a fighting tournament and seize control, which would be the end of everything as we know it. You got it? Each of the game's seven characters has their own personal story and motivations for participating in the tournament. For example, we're told in his biography and ending that Sub-Zero is a member of the Lin Kuei Ninja Clan, and he was only competing in the tournament to kill Shang Tsung, as he was paid an insane amount of money to do so. On the other end, we're told Scorpion is from the rival clan to Sub-Zero's. His ending reveals that he was murdered by Sub-Zero before the tournament ever began, and that his demons have resurrected him as a specter in order to gain revenge. Of course, it's not really all that simple, as Sub-Zero's ending isn't canonical to the story, and he was not the one to win the tournament. I mean, Scorpion didn't win it either, but his ending of murdering Sub-Zero out of revenge is canon. This is only the beginning of how hard this all is to follow, but stick with me. There are five other playable characters to choose from outside of the two ninjas. We've got Kano, the Black Dragon mercenary. We've got his nemesis, Special Forces agent Sonya Blade. There's the God of Thunder, Raiden. Johnny Cage is a talented martial artist turned dickheaded Hollywood actor. And Liu Kang, the Shaolin monk who would go on to defeat Shang Tsung and win the tournament, saving Earthrealm. Mortal Kombat stood out immediately in arcades not just for its gratuitous use of violence, but for its graphical style. Characters in the game don't look anything like the cartoon characters of its main competitor Street Fighter 2, as Mortal Kombat's fighters are all real people. This style was achieved by digitizing each individual movement from real-life actors in a studio and placing the photographs into the game. It may not look like much now, but in 1992, this shit was insane. One of my fondest memories in my near 30 years of existence on this planet is the first time I ever saw the pit. Fighting to the death on a bridge no more than three feet wide is a terrifying prospect to begin with. But it wasn't until the fight ended that I found out just how terrifying it could be. This is an event I would mimic each and every time I play with my action figures for the rest of my childhood. The pit isn't just scary and brutal, it's fucking iconic. But knocking your opponent into the pit is not the only way to brutally finish a fight in Mortal Kombat. No way! Remember those seven characters we talked about earlier? All of them have their own distinct finishing move. I'm talking, of course, about fatalities. Whether you're ripping someone's head off with the spinal cord still attached, or tearing their still beating heart out of their chest, these finishing moves are one of the driving forces behind what makes Mortal Kombat so special. It's one thing to beat your friend's ass when they thought they could take you down, but it's another thing entirely when you punch their fucking head right off their body. Johnny Cage wins. Fatalities are the ultimate period at the end of the sentence, and I'll never forget the very few times I was able to pull them off as a kid. You gotta remember, there was no internet back then. You couldn't just Google, how do I do a fatality? Because there was no Google. You had to go out to recess with your friends and tell them that you were button mashing and you blew a kiss to Sonya and your opponent's skin burned off. And half the time they wouldn't believe you, but that's the way it goes. Not everybody thought fatalities were awesome though. The focus was on video games. Under pressure from an angry congress and angrier parents, game makers offered a new rating system. The timing of the peace offering was no accident. Just an hour later, the Senate began hearings on new legislation to prevent violent games from reaching kids. It is a sick, disgusting video game in my judgment. 
shame on people that produce that trash. It's child abuse in my judgment. The Entertainment Software Ratings Board, or ESRB, cracked down hard and changed the way it handled ratings in large part to how gnarly some of the fatalities were. It could have been awful. It could have led to video games being censored and changed to protect consumers. But luckily, that didn't happen. Oh wait, yeah it did. The Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat was stripped down to the bones and not in a cool way. Blood was replaced with sweat and fatalities were swapped with censored finishing moves. For instance, Sub-Zero doesn't rip his opponent's head off on the Super Nintendo. Instead, he just, he just punches them really hard. The Sega Genesis version came complete with the blood code. Entering ABACABB at the title screen turns on all of the fantastic violence you bought the game for in the first place. Side note, the Super Nintendo version still has the pit, and you can still knock your opponent off the bridge. And when they hit the bottom, there's no blood. Are they insinuating that your opponent missed all of the goddamn spikes? Get the fuck out of here. Each and every level looks different and gives an awesome sense of progression. The courtyard gives us our first look at the boss, Shang Tsung, as he watches our fight from his throne. The palace gates looks like it leads directly to the courtyard, and the warrior shrine shows the passage of time, as the night sky has drowned out the shining sun from earlier levels. Test Your Might, Test your might is a mini game that pops up after every third win in single player mode. The goal is to mash the absolute dog shit out of the face buttons and slam the block button down once you've raised your might high enough to destroy the object in front of you. There are five objects of increasing difficulty, measuring from wood, to stone, to steel, to ruby, to diamond. Good luck with the diamond, and good luck with the blisters you're going to get trying to break all of these items. Shang Tsung may be the final boss of the game, but his sub-boss underling is where it's at for me. The four-armed half-man, half-dragon Shokan Prince Goro haunted my nightmares for years. While every other character was a real person whose movements were captured in a studio, Goro was actually captured using a clay model and stop-motion animation. Which, I guess isn't all that surprising, seeing as though there's no living human with four fucking arms. Mortal Kombat wasn't always called Mortal Kombat, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. According to series creator Ed Boon, the names Kumite, Dragon Attack, Death Blow, and Fatality were all considered at one point. It wasn't until Steve Ritchie, a pinball designer, was in Boone's office that the official name took hold. He saw the word combat written on a sheet of paper and said, Why don't you just call it Mortal Kombat? The title stuck. But why spell it with a K? Well, a Midway employee drew a K over the C in combat as a goof, and that stuck too. Who would have imagined it was that simple? Another interesting piece of history comes in the shape of Jean-Claude Van Damme, the man Mortal Kombat was initially based on. No, Van Damme wasn't supposed to be in Mortal Kombat. Midway initially wanted to make a game entirely centered around him. Things didn't work out, but hey, that's the way it goes. At least they have Johnny Cage, the dickheaded actor guy who wears black tights with a red sash and hmm, does a split into a dick punch. I don't know, maybe Midway was a little bitter. Mortal Kombat and secrets go together like lamb and tuna fish. Lamb and tuna fish? Maybe you like spaghetti and meatball? Be more comfortable with that analogy? Hidden levels, characters, and fatalities, they're all mainstays of the series, and it all started with Reptile, the green ninja who randomly appears and delivers cryptic, sometimes subliminal message to the player on how to find him. The key to battling Reptile is to watch for an obstruction to pass by the moon when fighting at the pit. If you're skilled enough to pull off a double flawless victory with a fatality, Reptile will appear and challenge you to a fight at the corpse littered bottom of the pit. Reptile is extremely fast and possesses the special moves of both Sub-Zero and Scorpion. Defeating him earns the player 10 million points. Several glitches can be exploited in the game, mostly during fatalities. If your timing is right and you're playing as Johnny Cage, you can uppercut your opponent's head off more than once. If you're Sub-Zero, try performing your fatality as Raiden is in the process of getting back to his feet. 
His head comes off just fine, but the rest of his body stays blue as it was caught mid-animation. Try these out for yourself, they're oddly satisfying. Oh, no, September 13th, 1993 was dubbed Mortal Monday and marked the home console releases of Mortal Kombat on Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Gear, and Game Boy. Mortal Kombat took the world by storm. The arcades were making in obscene amounts of money before the home console release ever happened. The first game sold more than 2.5 million units on Sega Genesis alone. Fans were clamoring for more, and it did not take long for a sequel to find its way home. Mortal Kombat 2 hit arcades in April of 1993, bringing with it faster gameplay, more blood, more characters, and a darker aesthetic to coincide with the game's new setting. The game takes place in Outworld, giving Shao Kahn the home field advantage. Who the fuck is Shao Kahn, you may ask? Shao Kahn is the emperor of Outworld. After Liu Kang beat Shang Tsung in the original tournament, Shao Kahn wanted to execute him for his failures and for being responsible for the apparent death of Laura. The game's intro explains that Khan only spared Shang Tsung after he devised a plan to lure Earthrealm's fighters into Khan's homeland, where he'd have the advantage in hopes of winning the second tournament and continuing their plan to take over Earthrealm. The new setting of Outworld gives Mortal Kombat 2 a completely different look from its predecessor. The sunny skies and brightly colored flags and banners are nowhere to be found, replaced instead by crumbling stone, burning effigies, chaotic skies, scorching pools of acid, and a forest full of trees that have taken on seemingly human faces. Joining the action in MK2 are Kitana, Melina, Kung Lao, Boraka, and Jax. The only characters not playable from MK1 are Sonya and Kano, although they do appear in the background of the Khan's Arena stage. Ed Boon stated that Kano and Sonya were removed simply because they were the least used characters from the original game, which is understandable. Alongside the aforementioned five debuting fighters, Shang Tsung and Reptile are now fully playable. Shang Tsung's change in appearance is explained in the intro, stating that Shao Kahn restored the sorcerer's youth, giving him a second chance to stop Earthrealm's fighters. Kintaro is the game's sub-boss, another four-armed Shokan. He sports a tiger stripe design, and was actually supposed to be a bipedal tiger of sorts, but it was determined that a poseable figure of that nature was going to be too hard to pull off. Mortal Kombat 2 takes the cryptic and secretive nature of the first game and turns that shit up to 11. Reptile kept us guessing in Mortal Kombat 1, but who the fuck is that green chick here in MK2? Where does this weird portal go? And wait, who was that gray ninja back there? I'm about to tell you some secrets. The green mystery woman isn't just a female reptile, no sir. Her name is Jade, and to uncover her, you've got to win the fight right before the question mark on the arcade ladder using only low kick. This is way harder than it sounds, trust me. To answer the portal question of where does that lead to, well, it leads to Earthrealm. Or, more specifically, Goro's Lair from the first game. To enter the portal, you have to land an uppercut on your opponent. And if some weird fucker pops out of the corner of the screen and shouts, you gotta hurry up! Press down and start before he disappears and you'll be met with a challenge from an undiscovered warrior from Mortal Kombat 1. Smoke is another palette swap ninja, joining the ranks of Sub-Zero, Scorpion, and Reptile. Similar to Reptile from the first game, he's fast as fuck and shows a moveset with Scorpion. This next secret fighter is either the most difficult to discover or the least difficult to discover, depending on whether you do it by the book. What are the requirements, you ask? Oh, not much. Just win 50 fights in a row. This sounds impossible, I know. But you can just plug it in two controllers and cheat the shit out of it if you want. That's where the buy the book part comes in. Round one, fight. Noob Saibot lacks any definition to his character model and appears to be made only of the void, only of shadows and emptiness. He has Sub-Zero's stance and victory pose, but possesses Scorpion's spear move. The identity of all three of these secret characters are kept mostly under wraps, but we'll touch more on them later in the series. Side note. Noob Saibot is Boon Tobias backwards for Ed Boon and John Tobias.
I stated earlier that MK2 brought more violence to the table, and holy shit, that might be a bit of an understatement. Some of the new fatalities here make Sub-Zero's head ripping from the first game look like child's play. I think the nastiest ones by far are Jax ripping his opponent's arms off. Jax wins. Reptile tearing off and eating his opponent's entire head. Reptile wins. And Kung Lao brutally slicing his opponent's body down the middle. Splitting them like cattle in a meat Kung factory. Lao wins. Flawless victory. Fatality. That is fucking nasty. Every level has something sinister about it. There's dripping lava, trees with sharp teeth, sketchy cliffs in the background. There's all sorts of nasty shit going on here. Your mind would go wild at the endless possibilities wondering just what the hell you might be able to pull off with the right button combination. There are three distinct stage fatalities in Mortal Kombat 2, ranging from the Deadpool, to the Combat Tomb, to the Pit 2. The Deadpool is a thin walkway suspended over sizzling dark pools of green acid. Knocking your opponent into the toxic wastes melts their skin off instantaneously. Fatality. The combat tomb is a claustrophobic stone setting with an eerily low hanging ceiling. That's not going to be good for business. That's not going to be good for anybody. The Pit 2 is especially scary. How do you improve on a classic? The Pit 2 is way, way higher off the ground, so the fall is much scarier. But there are no spikes at the bottom. Instead, sharp, jagged rocks await any poor bastard unlucky enough to lose a fight atop the bridge. Kitana wins. Flawless victory. Fatality. It wasn't all blood and guts, though. Babalities and friendships were introduced in Mortal Kombat 2 to give you a way to humiliate your friends after beating them without brutally killing them. Who wouldn't want to turn their sore loser friend into a little itty bitty crybaby? Liu Kang wins. Babality. And leave it to Shang Tsung to bring a little color to the otherwise drab and macabre lands of Outworld. Wins. Friendship. Friendship? The rumor mills were working overtime in Mortal Kombat 2. That's a fact. See those two guys fighting back there? Players went insane wondering who these guys were. Fans figured that the green guy was named Hornbuckle after misinterpreting cryptic hints dropped by Smoke and Jade, when in reality the name simply referred to a woman found in the game's credits. The Man on Fire was originally nicknamed Torch by curious players. Interestingly enough, Torch was later turned into a full-on canonical character in the series, taking on the name Blades. It turns out he was actually a pretty fucking big deal, as we'll talk about in great detail later in the series. The canonical ending to Mortal Kombat 2 is Liu Kang's ending. With Shao Kahn defeated and disgraced, Liu Kang returns to the seclusion of his Shaolin Temple. He pays his respects to his lost brothers and finally realizes that the events which have taken place were all the fulfillment of his destiny. Mortal Kombat 2 released on home consoles on September 9th, 1994, which Midway dubbed as Mortal Friday. Inside of the first few weeks, console sales were already over 2.5 million units. MK2 was proclaimed the best-selling video game in the world up to that point. But what comes next? You will never win. Mortal Kombat 3 released on April 15, 1995 and changed the MK formula quite a bit. Combatants all had individually programmed combos this time around, making each character feel much more unique than both games prior. The long-rumored animality finishing move was introduced in Mortal Kombat 3, but could only be pulled off after you've shown mercy to your opponent in the third round. Some of the greatest animalities included Cyrax turning into a great white shark, Kano delivering a deadly bite as a tarantula, and Stryker morphing into a T-Rex and biting his opponent clean in half, because why not? Not all of them are cool, though. Why the fuck does Smoke turn into a Shadow Bull? And why does Shiva turn into a Scorpion, rather than fucking Scorpion turning into a Scorpion? Oh, maybe because Scorpion isn't in the game. 
Now might be the time to elaborate on some of those changes I mentioned earlier, the changes that really shook up the MK formula. Combos and finishing moves weren't the only noticeable differences. For the first and only time in Mortal Kombat's history, Scorpion is not in the game. He's arguably the franchise's most popular figure, and he's nowhere to be found. Let's take a look at this character select screen, because it's a fucking doozy. We've still got Shang Tsung, Liu Kang, Jax, Sonya, Kung Lao, and the returning Kano, so there are recognizable faces. But who the fuck is that guy? Oh, that's Sub-Zero. His mask is gone and his appearance is totally different, but I guess if we beat Mortal Kombat 2 as Sub-Zero, we'd have known he was going to change. But who are these other people? Sindel is Shao Kahn's queen, who was dead before he resurrected her solely to do his bidding. Stryker is a riot control officer who was on duty when the Outworld portals opened up over his city. Cyrax and Sector are cyborg ninjas built by the Lin Kuei with one purpose, to kill Sub-Zero, who has gone rogue, which explains his change in costume. Nightwolf is a Native American dude who is extremely protective of his tribe's land, so protective that he's willing to fight Shao Kahn to protect it. Shiva represents the Shokan just like Goro and Kentaro before her, and Cabal is a mystery man who was horrifically scarred during an Outworld attack. His mask has artificial respirators built into it, and without them, he would die. Side note, Cyrax and Sector were initially called Mustard and Ketchup before they were given official names. The fighters themselves weren't the only area where things visually evolved either. Mortal Kombat 1's levels all had a strong Asian flavor to them. In Mortal Kombat 2, we shifted to Outworld, a setting full of odd forms and somber tapestry. In Mortal Kombat 3, things look much more familiar. We're fighting on city streets, in modern churches, in the goddamn subway? But how did we get here? What happened? The basic plot of Mortal Kombat 3 is this. Shao Kahn realizes he might be fucked after eating back-to-back -back losses in the last two tournaments, and he cooks up a scheme that allows him to travel to Earthrealm and basically take it by force, stealing the souls of billions of innocent people in the process. Outworld and Earthrealm are fusing into one dimension, which explains why Khan's tower can be seen looming in the background of certain seemingly earthly settings. Another brand new feature comes in the shape of a run button, which allows for faster movement and affects your ability to perform combos. Connecting with an uppercut in certain levels will send your opponent flying so high that they'll break through the ceiling and into a new area. This was an awesome feature to take advantage of any time you played with friends. The cat and mouse game of landing a nasty uppercut was definitely an MK3 highlight. A well-trained ear will also notice that the music changes from screen to screen. <laughs> Difficulty levels for arcade mode make their debut in the shape of Choose Your Destiny. Choose your destiny. For real, grimy badasses always aim for the highest level and are usually humbled quicker than they can say, oh, I fucked up. Stage fatalities became a staple for the series in Mortal Kombat 2, and there was no way to make Mortal Kombat 3 without bringing them back. But what kind of hazards can we find in a modern city setting? Well, you can knock your opponent onto the subway tracks and have them run over by a train, for one. The bell tower hazard sees your opponent falling through six floors before they're skewered on basement spikes that are at least seven feet long. Hold on, why the fuck are there giant spikes in the basement of this bell tower? Who built this place? And last but not least, we've got the Pit 3. The longest fall of them all and arguably the most sinister surprise at the bottom. That's fucked up. Cyrax wins. Unlike the first two games, who feature forearm Shokans as their sub-bosses, Mortal Kombat 3 introduces the centaur, Motaro. He's immune to projectile attacks and even bounces some of them back at the player for having the audacity to try attacking him. Like his sub-boss brethren before him, Motaro was also animated using stop-motion technology. Playing multiplayer matches gave you the opportunity to enter combat codes. Players use the face buttons to try and correctly input a code that can either allow you to fight secret characters, play as Smoke, or even unlock the 1981 arcade classic Galaga. This may be blasphemous to some hardcore Mortal Kombat fans out there, and don't get me wrong, I'm one of you, but I don't particularly like Mortal Kombat 3. I was never able to fully master the combo system, and while I don't think the roster sucks, it's also far from the best they've ever done, and 
While the soundtrack is great, the levels themselves don't really do a whole lot for me. I just wish there was a way that Midway could have expanded on Mortal Kombat 3 and we wouldn't have Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 released in November of 1995, barely six months after the release of the original version. This updated version adds missing characters like Reptile, Katana, Jade, and Scorpion, as well as unlockable secret characters like Classic Sub-Zero, Ermac, Melina, and Human Smoke. Rumors exploded through arcades and classrooms over the mysterious purple ninja named Rain in the game's attract mode. Although players tried and tried to figure out a way to either fight him or play as him, it was all in vain, as Rain isn't really in the game at all. Ed Boon slipped him into the game's attract mode simply to stir up rumors and to tip his cap to one of his favorite musicians. He's a purple ninja named Rain, and he's the prince of Edenia. You get it? If you don't, lose my number. The ultimate version of the game didn't just add missing characters or red herrings, though. Two-on-two -two combat brings an entirely new layer of fun to the multiplayer side of things, and the AI was highly improved for the single-player portion of the game. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 closed the original trilogy in style, introducing new gameplay mechanics and ways- Jesus Christ, this isn't going to end, is it? Mortal Kombat Trilogy dropped one year after Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, bringing together all of the characters from the first three games into one giant, bloody, fatality fuckfest. It was the first Mortal Kombat game to not have an arcade release. It was also the first time that Shao Kahn, Goro, Kintaro, Motaro, and Human Smoke were all natively playable. And not to be left out in the mystery department, the game adds a new secret character named Chameleon, a ninja who rapidly changes stance and color and shares the moveset of every ninja in the game. To sum it up, He's fucking awesome. Wins. Mortal Kombat Trilogy was a massive success, achieving even greater sales than Mortal Kombat 3 before it. With three entries in the series, one expansion, and a compilation game inside of just four years, Mortal Kombat was about to expand, shifting into an entirely different dimension. Thank you to everybody who's joining for this, The History of Mortal Kombat Part 1, the original trilogy. I can't wait to drop Part 2 on you, Fatality in the Third Dimension, next month. Make sure you stick around and click that subscribe button because this is just the tip of the iceberg with the History of Mortal Kombat series. And if you need something to fill your time in between, make sure you check out my History of Smackdown series, which I did in 2017. I love you. I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you for joining